Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for a panel discussion hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST for short. My name is Ariel Liger, and I am CCAST Grassland Community of Practice Coordinator. I sit at the University of Arizona in Tucson, uh, and I wanted to start by respectfully acknowledging that the University of Arizona is on the land and territories of Indigenous peoples. Today, Arizona is home to 22 federally recognized tribes, with Tucson being home to the Odom and Yaqui. Uh, the University of Arizona is committed to diversity and inclusion and strives to build sustainable relationships with sovereign Native nations and Indigenous communities through educational offerings, partnerships, and community service. CCAST supports issue-based landscape scale conservation by facilitating peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange through case studies, webinars like this one, and workshops. These activities support the development of communities of practice focused on grassland restoration, non-native aquatic species, and drought adaptation. Our webinar today is gonna to be a little bit different than our, our usual webinars. Instead of one speaker, we'll have three that'll be sharing today. And we'll follow those three presentations by a panel discussion. Um, we encourage everybody to use the chat to put in questions as we go along. We'd love to hear um, from you and want really the questions of participants to be guiding that discussion at the end of the three presentations. Um, and we will keep track of those questions. And then during that discussion, we'll call on people to unmute and ask those questions if they, they feel comfortable. If not, we can pose them uh, to the speakers as well. Some of our goals here are not just to, to get information from the panelists, but for the panelists as well to be able to hear from you all uh, as they develop the tools that they're developing um, and keep refining the tools that they have developed. So our three speakers today are uh, Dr. Elise Gornish from the University of Arizona's Cooperative Extension, uh, Dr. Amanda Haverlin from the American Bird Conservancy, uh, and Austin Rutherford, a PhD candidate in the Archer Lab at the University of Arizona. Um, we're gonna start today with Austin Rutherford's presentation. Um, and Austin, uh, as I said, is a PhD candidate at the University of Arizona in the School of Natural Resources and, and the Environment. He studies ecology, management, and restoration of rangelands. His interests include combining the use of remote sensing with knowledge of plant and soil ecology to restore southwestern grasslands. As part of his dissertation work, he and collaborators are developing a geospatial model and an interactive mapping decision support tool to assist land managers in Southern Arizona evaluate a site's susceptibility to shrub encroachment. And without further ado, I'll stop sharing and I'll let Austin. Great, thank you, Ariel. Let's see, okay. Get it going here and you can hear me okay? We can hear you great and we can see the slides. Perfect. All right, well, uh, thank you for that great introduction and thank you for the opportunity to speak with everyone today and sit on the panel. Um, I'm going to be talking about a project uh, that stemmed from a bit of my uh, dissertation work that is expanded into trying to develop and update some existing online resources for managing shrub encroachment. Um, and this is a project that Elise, who's on the panel uh, today as well, is involved in, but also my major advisor, Steve Archer, and then also um, members of the Rangelands uh, Partnership, uh, Sheila Merrigan. And so we're all probably familiar with the term brush management. It's an umbrella term that we use um, collectively for all the, the, the treatment types that we use in grassland restoration be it uh, chemical, uh, like herbicidal, uh, mechanical ways to meet the land management or the grassland restoration goals that we have, whether it is to um, slow soil erosion or uh, improve wildlife habitat, or try to get a state, a uh, shrub invaded state back to its historical grassland condition. And this project is uh, specifically designed um, is funded by the USDA and is specifically designed to create a prototypic toolkit, quote unquote toolkit. And it's uh, gutted to uh, allow members of the general public, be it um, also ranchers, producers, uh, private landowners, agency, uh, land managers, or anyone interested in trying to get at or find answers to the questions, 
what is brush management or what are the various treatment options for brush management. And that's really part one of this. And I'll expand on that here in a little bit, as well as on this next one, which is part two, um, where we're developing a web geospatial web application um, or web tool, kind of like if you're familiar with drought view or range lens analysis platform in that same vein um, to try to develop the app to answer the question, how close is a given parcel of land in Southeast Arizona to reaching its maximum potential cover, woody cover? And I'll also go into more in depth with that. And it's a collaboration with the Rangelands Partnership and also folks here at the University of Arizona and the Communications and Cyber Technologies Groups, um, which has an extensive history in developing websites, but also uh, geospatial web applications like um, my range log is one that they've, they've done more recently. And so updating and expanding existing resources. Uh, many of you might be familiar with the Rangelands Gateway, formerly Global Rangelands, and it's a, a website, um, an extensive website that the Rangelands Partnership has de developed that uh, covers many, many topics across rangeland ecology and management. Um, it, it, it includes a lot of um, literary sources and also short web pages on information and great videos and uh, tools and uh, the global um, context of what's going on in rangelands around the globe. And we're working and partnering with uh, the rangelands partnership to expand their brush management section. Um, it's a subsection of their vegetation management and restoration uh, topic area. And currently as it sits, it's just a uh, one web page uh, with a paragraph introducing what uh, shrub encroachment is, the importance of grasslands, and uh, the just listing the different types of brush management treatment types. And so we're expanding this to be multiple web pages, including an introductory uh, brush management one that will have uh, a list of tools, but also monitoring resources and, and like very important papers. Uh, but, and then within that create separate web pages for um, the different brush management treatments or methods, biological, chemical, the, mul the multiple cultural types, uh, mechanical methods, um, integrated brush management systems, which if you're familiar with integrated pest management, it's just kind of like that uh, protocol book for uh, shrubs specifically. And then also um, information from previous brush management workshops uh, that have been conducted here in Southeastern Arizona. The current progress with that is that we're in the drafting stage of the each web page. So we are developing the text or updating existing text on the website. And then we're going to um, and then we're going to actually move that text and the links into uh, non-published web pages and to test the web layouts where uh, Elise and my advisor, Steve, are, and probably others will collectively review it and update the text or add additional text where needed. And then uh, that way we can quickly move it from its draft stage onto being published on Rangelands Gateway. And now for part two, we are developing a this new uh, web application prototype that will have a number of data layers as part of it that uh, we from searching through the literature and through reviewing it have determined the, the variables that are most important for determining, determining a site's uh, shrub cover. And those can be things like topography aspect, slope, uh, the climate, um, when that rainfall comes, the, what's on the ground at the time, and also soil type is very important for understanding uh, shrub cover. And then we're also incorporating some of my dissertation work, which is a model to predict uh, a site's maximum shrub cover based off a lot of those biophysical variables that will also be available in the web application. And the maximum shrub cover is we're taking the difference from the maximum shrub cover and its current shrub cover to know to then calculate a risk level. And that's where areas that uh, are at low risk uh, would be areas to say, let's is predicted to have a 5% shrub cover and it currently does have a 5% shrub, uh, shrub cover, then that, those, that would be fairly stable site is shrub cover is not predicted to change very much over time. Compare that to a high risk area where let's say it's predicted to have a 30% shrub cover, but currently it only has a 5% cover. So that means that moving into the future, those regions or part of that area is probably or most likely going to see an increase in shrub cover over time. And because it's susceptible for additional shrub encroachment, 
those would be areas to make a priority for monitoring for um, for monitoring for shrub encroachment, but also the grass community that is there and the shrub type that is there and IDing areas that if you wanted to get the most bang for your buck out of doing brush management treatments, it would be easier to treat on areas that haven't reached that maximum potential shrub cover and instead focus on areas that uh, you can maintain its current state at that time. And I, I can get into more of that during the panel discussion if you would like. Um, part of the CCT, um, app development process is uh, conducting short potential user interviews. And we develop questions to try to ID specific, um, the specific uh, functionalities of the application itself, but also the data that would be important to the potential users. And we got representatives here from uh, local, uh, Altar Valley Conservation Alliance, but also Pima County, the NRCS and the uh, Bureau of Land Management. Um, and we just we kept getting the same or very similar information from the group, so we decided to stop them for now and then move into the design and development stage. And just uh, quickly, some of the layers that seemed to be or that were the most important um, for the potential users were it was the the risk model itself, uh, which initially is going to be at the Santa Rita Experimental Range because I'm developing and testing the model there, but I'm trying to develop it in a reproducible framework for uh, expansion and quick expansion, hopefully as well. Uh, but then shrub cover, bare ground, um, historical fire perimeters uh, came up pretty often, um, land ownership, so knowing where the state land is versus the, the public land versus the private land, uh, precipitation information, slope, slope is important for determining what type of uh, feasible equipment for brush management can be used on the landscape, same with distance to nearest wash, uh, rangeland productivity is a product that the U.S. Forest Service has been putting out um, usually every year, it's usually lags about a year, but um, that was important. And also ecological sites, ecological sites came up over and over again for good reason. And I'm also trying to incorporate ways to uh, make it so a user can click on a polygon of an ecological site, bring up the name of it, but then also be able to link directly to um, the ecological site description that contains the NRCS provided state and transition models, dominant plant species types that uh, at least on the reference condition, what is there and then also their provided production soil cover and canopy structure data and, uh, and that's just a selection of all the different things that are in the ecological site condition, but that would save some of the trouble of trying to search through all of that um, through other tools or online as well. Um, we wanted to keep this as a open source application because going down the Esri ArcGIS route, our hands would be tied on trying to troubleshoot or fix any problems or to change any of the, the colors or the layout of the application. So we're working with CCT to make sure that um, from those interviews as well, that you can click and click off layers, scroll, zoom, multi-panel viewing, change the opacity or see-through of the different layers, uh, the drawing types, um, being able to save PDFs and pictures of the app or the map of the app itself, uh, being able to upload shape files of pastures and being able to extract data from those shape files. And then most importantly, that came up a few times is being able to use on a tablet and mobile devices. And that's one of the specialties of CCT is that um, it's, it's nice to have something functional on a desktop, but sometimes um, or more often it's also best to have it uh, viewable and usable on a tablet and mobile device. So just to recap, I uh, put my email up here. Uh, this is a prototype starting small, starting in a small geospatial location. Um, the, the toolkit is gonna be a combined update of the Rangelands Gateway information and the web app. We're gonna have a tool section so we can take some of the hassle of saving a bunch of bookmarked links of a bunch of tools uh, specific, specifically focused on the topic of shrub encroachment and brush management, is including the link to this new uh, geospatial web app, uh, monitoring resources and guides. We have plans on developing some simple decision trees. There's no silver bullet for uh, brush management, unfortunately, but maybe try to think through some of the, the decisions to make it a little easier to know which uh, routes, be it prescribed burning or uh, mechanical or chemical treatments we can go through and additional readings, important papers. Um, next steps, um, once it's released, we'll advertise it all through email lists and newsletters like Cooperative Extension, Arizona 
um, section SRM and uh, folks like here through CCAS, uh, Grassland COP, uh, plan on live demos and user guides for the web app itself to make it easier to figure out how to use it. Um, and then uh, gain feedback review and improvements, which will be very important for um, trying to make sure that it's most useful for our potential users. Uh, the project started last fall and it goes through the fall of 2022 with possible extension. Right now we're in the wireframe lockup mode. Um, so we're, we're moving into hopefully testing and getting feedback at the end of this year or the beginning of early next year. And that's it, thank you. Thank you so much, Austin. Um, I'm really excited to see that tool evolve and to, to see the rollout. If anybody has any questions for Austin, please put those in, in the chat. If you have questions about maybe your own applications for a tool like this, whether your geography will be covered, um, whatever you have, uh, please, we'll have time to, to dig into that after um, Amanda and Elise's presentation. Um, and now I'll pass it on to our next presenter, uh, who's Amanda Haverland. And Amanda Haverland is coming to us from the American Bird Conservancy, um, and we'll be talking about triage, uh, a decision support tool that's being developed by the Rio Grande, Sonoran, Oaks and Prairies, and Playa Lakes Joint Ventures to understand the effects that woody plant removal is having on bird communities. And I'll pass it to Amanda to give us much more details about this tool. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to talk. Let me share here. Cool. So yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk about this upcoming decision support tool that we're calling Triage. Uh, and the creation of this tool is being funded by the NRCS Conservation Innovation Grant Program, uh, along with these four migratory bird joint ventures, which are Playa Lakes, Oaks and Prairies, Rio Grande, and Sonoran. So our intent with Triage is to produce a tool that can help with decision making for implementing conservation programs. So the tool itself will address wildlife benefits and specifically grassland bird benefits of brush removal from two perspectives. So top down or at a large scale programmatic level. So that would be evaluating changes in the grassland bird community at the state by BCR level or greater uh, down to the county or cluster of county scale. And then from a bottom up or practice level, which would be estimating the benefit of a particular practice on grassland bird species below the state by BCR level. So why is this tool needed? Well, shrub encroachment is a significant problem in the prairies and all four of the JVs involved here are dealing with this issue in their planning. So as it turns out, we all have bird monitoring data related to shrubs and shrub management. And also there is an existing spatial vegetation data set that covers most of the JV area, meaning we have the necessary data to model the outcomes of different scenarios and hopefully aid in planning and land management strategies. So we believe that uh, at the landscape scale, this tool could help focus conservation efforts and also help with funding and grant writing uh, and hopefully contribute to the whole picture of conservation outcomes. And we also believe this tool could help find and or justify current grassland stronghold areas and show how the bird community can grow as the stronghold is expanded. So there are a few aspects of this tool that make it innovative and unique. It will be spatially explicit, meaning that models will combine uh, bird population estimates with a landscape map. And then with this map locations of habitat patches, individuals and other items of interest are explicitly incorporated into the model. Um, and the effects of changing landscape features on po population dynamics can be studied. Uh, also, we are considering the entire annual cycle. While many tools are available for decision support during the breeding season, very few tools actually incorporate non-breeding habitat needs and to our knowledge, none consider the entire annual cycle. And finally, we plan to have an international scope since our study area reaches into northern New Mexico. 
Uh, so the primary users we have in mind are biologists, including those who work on private lands or outreach and also conservation delivery specialists. And this tool will be available uh, online to biologists and also to landowners, but we really envision landowners using it by way of introduction from biologists. So here are the locations of the four joint ventures that are collaborating on this project. And then uh, here's the, the area that the tool will cover, which is sort of a combination of the footprint of those four JVs and six bird conservation regions. And we have bird data for almost this entire region. So there are lots of people from many organizations involved in the development of this tool. The main collaborators who wrote the grant proposal for the project are these four migratory bird joint ventures. And we're getting ready to put together a science committee. And we have already actively been consulting with members of an advisory committee that is made up of a diverse group of biologists who pretty much all fall into that category of primary user for the tri triage tool. So we're actually just getting started with this project. Uh, we're starting to compile the data and uh, run some models. And once we get that aspect up and running, we plan to pull in the science team to check out our work and then build out the tool from there. Uh, for the top down or the large scale analysis, we're gonna be using boosted regression trees, which is a form of machine learning. And for the bottom up analysis, we plan to use hierarchical distance sampling models. We've already acquired the spatial data that we plan to use. Uh, from the folks that created the rangeland analysis platform, also known as RAP. And these data show percent cover of forbs and grass, trees and shrubs, um, and estimates of forage biomass as well. If you're more interested in that, um, RAP is easy to find online if you just type in rangeland analysis platform in the search engine. And so some of the limitations of this tool are that our results are constrained to the area of interest, and then further constrained by bird sample sizes. So we need at least 80 observations of a species in order to create reliable models. However, we do have enough data for at least 130 species, which I think is a pretty good number. Um, and then there are just limitations inherent with modeling itself. Models are not perfect. Um, and there are a multiple, multiple other factors that can affect bird population densities and habitat use. So users really need to keep these things in mind when they're using this tool. So we've created a mock-up and I'll run through really briefly just to give you a visual idea of what we have in mind. The colors and logos that you see here are not set to this. this everything here is just for example. So first the user will choose which scale to work from the bottom up or top down. Um, here top down is selected. And then from there, the user input tabs are revealed, which are area, birds, and cover. On the area tab, you have uh, the option to select or to um, input um, your area of interest in different ways. So you can select a state, a county, or a conservation region, or a combination of those. You could also upload a shapefile or draw a polygon. Um, so if the user selects a VCR, for example, it would load the shapefile into the map. And then next, you would select the bird species you're interested in. And this list will contain many more than six, um, like you see here. And then on the cover tab, the starting value for the area of interest um, is displayed at the top. And then the user would enter a proposed change in shrub cover. And then click the Run button. And you get a results box with different tabs of data. The first one would show projected bird density for the species that were selected. Uh, the next tab is population changes for those species. And then possibly more tabs with different types of result outputs that we're still trying to uh, figure out. Um, and then the final tab allows the users to export the results. Um, and then if you'd start over, you can do um, from the bottom up and um, it would be basically the same thing, but slightly different options that we're still working out. And that was the end. Um, so uh, the, probably the, the person who's more knowledgeable about everything, this project is Ann Bartasevich of the Playa Lakes Joint Venture. This was sort of her brainchild. Um, so here's her contact info as well as mine. And I guess we're taking the questions at the end, so. 
Thank you, Amanda. That's great. Um, also really excited for this tool to come out. I'm really, uh, yeah, it's great to see something that has that binational scope, a tool that doesn't end at the border like a lot of these tools do. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, as a reminder, if anybody has any questions, please feel free to put those into the chat. Uh, and we'll also have time at the end uh, for you to ask questions directly. Our third speaker today is Elise Gornish. Um, and Elise uh, works at the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension um, and is a restoration ecologist uh, re who researches novel and feasible approaches to dryland restoration that take into account invasive species, climate change, and soil ecology. Uh, Elise is the self-described queen of seed balls, and I'll let her uh, tell you about Eco Restore Portal, which is a great tool to use um, when you're planning a restoration. So take it away, Elise. Thanks, Ariel. I appreciate it. Let me start my little thing. So hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about Eco Restore, which is this sort of um, my mind is sort of one-stop shopping for all things ecological restoration for Arizona, although it is still extremely relevant for all the Southwest. So EcoRestore is an online portal, which in my view, I'm the developer and maintainer of this, in my view should be the one and hopefully main or only place that you need to go either as a backyard gardener, a master gardener, a land manager, a rancher, a farmer, anyone who's interested in getting native plants back into the soil, back into the ground, um, this should be the place you should go. So the way Eco Restore is set up, it is supported by the University of Arizona and um, University of Arizona Cooperative Extension. And the way the site is set up, it's supposed to be extremely user-friendly because of the range of folks that we're hoping to target. So anyone from little old ladies who wanna plant some nice plants in their backyard to USGS folks who are familiar with ArcGIS and all that stuff, okay? The way Eco Restore is set up is um, sort of in the process of how uh, myself and many area land restoration ecologists think is the best way to think about doing ecological restoration, okay? So the first you see, when you get to the site, you'll see a bunch of um, menu options here, and we're gonna start at restoration goals. So you can't really get started with doing restoration until you know the general goal you want to achieve. So in general, obviously anyone that's doing ecological restoration wants to get native plants back on the ground, but do you want to enhance biodiversity, enhance erosion control, um, initiate some fire resistance, produce more forage, pollinator habitat, et cetera, et cetera. And any of these sort of first um, places to go gives you a little bit of an idea of sort of the headspace that you should be in when you're doing ecological restoration and gives you some resources. There's not a lot of stuff here. So what we were hoping is in the development of this that you would only need to click three times to get to a piece of information that you need. So there's not um, uh, a lot of detail in any aspect of anything you see on Eco Restore, but we thought that we developed it with enough detail that um, you get in the headspace that you need and you have an understanding of sort of the direction you wanna go. And we provide um, some of the best or we think the best resources for um, sort of pursuing that idea even more if you want to go to that, okay? So um, first you can look at your restoration goals and we give you some examples of things you wanna think about and some resources you might wanna look at um, when you're thinking about doing restoration for that goal. We provide you some um, recommendations for how you can prepare your site. So if you're gonna use grazing, remove invasive species, do some tisting, tisting tilling or dissing or um, add soil amendments. Um, again, these are all sort of um, a general description of why you might wanna think about these things and the most important things you want to keep in mind and some extra resources. Um, we also show you some uh, ways you can think about plant collection. So are you going to collect wild seed? Are you gonna purchase plants? Are you gonna trade them? There's this wild trading culture of plants in Arizona, it's amazing. Or are you gonna be doing transplanting? So moving plants from one area to another. Um, and how you apply the plant materials, okay? So we also have, ooh, I don't know what's going on here, but um, are you gonna do broadcast feeding, drill seeding, seed balls, hydro seeding? Okay, so hopefully once you get up to this point, you have an idea of sort of what your goal is, how you're gonna prepare the land and where you're gonna get the plant materials from. 
But the number one question that I get asked as a restoration ecologist is what plants should I install? Constantly people are asking me that. So we actually made that almost the centerpiece of Eco Restore. So right here, you can take a site assessment. And what the site assessment is, is a small quiz that asks you questions about um, your location in Arizona and your goals to try to pr provide for you a good candidate species list. It only takes two or three minutes. So let's go through this. So you can say where your county is, let's say we're in Pima County. And this is very important because obviously there are native plants that are native to Pima County, but not La Paz, for example. Um, we can put in our elevation. You can also leave any of these um, entries blank and that's okay. And there's some um, information notes that tell you about um, the question. You can put your soil type, um, maybe you have a lot of metal in your soil or salt here. Let's put caliche when one of us have caliche. Maybe you have some ecological conditions that apply to your site, high disturbance, you get a lot of flooding. It's actually a shaded area. Um, you might want to note if you're near a homestead, a playground, or if the site is grazed, that's really important for reducing or eliminating toxic plants from your plant list. Or if you're near an agricultural field, if you click this, um, weedy species will not be added to your list. And again, these are all natives, but there are some weedy natives. Um, you want to note what your uh, goal is. So let's say erosion control and then see recommendations. And what is going to pop out is a large list of recommended, recommended species that are native for your site and are known to accommodate all of those um, environmental factors that you list. Um, we are working on um, sort of a tiered list. So species that we highly recommend versus species that we sort of recommend. Um, and that's based on information that we have about the plant species. Um, one of the cool, and you could check out any of the plant species. We have a little bit of information about each plant as well as some additional information about their growth rate. Maybe you just wanna get a lot of plants down on the ground right now and you're not too worried about in the future. But in that case, you might want a super rapid um, growth rate for plants, um, and we give you a little bit more information about each plant. Um, and we have this warning, obviously, if you have grazing animals or sometimes if you're around a homestead or um, a playground, you don't want to put, um, you don't want to include species in your list that um, are toxic, for example. Okay, um, so that's the site assessment. Um, and that's, that's how you get your list of species. So let's say now you've set up your goals, you have your pretreatment, you know which species you want, you buy your species and you do your restoration, you do planting um, or seeding. Post-restoration, there are some strategies. So there's ways that you can maintain your restoration um, location with uh, irrigation, grazing, monitoring, or mulch. Um, and there's always challenges associated with restoration as any, probably everyone here on the uh, call knows. So how you deal with animals eating your seedlings or eating your seeds and invasion pressure. Um, in addition to that, we have local resources. So another question I get asked a lot is like, okay, I want this species, where do I buy it? Well, you can come to this um, county resources map. You can click your county and we have a list of relevant resources for each county. So we have, um, this should be under here, but where can you buy plant materials? These are all the locations where you can buy native plant materials. Um, and these are gonna be mostly native. So although for example, Home Depot has like one or two natives, they're not gonna be on here because they're not uh, mostly natives, okay? Um, there's also plant lists. So lots of counties have uh, plant lists in case you wanna know, hmm, what plants are native to Pima County? You can check these out. Um, if you want, if you don't wanna do the restoration yourself, you can call restoration practitioners. So we have lists of those folks. And then there's lots of tools that we thought that would be relevant for particular counties for um, doing successful restoration. So there's things like contour map generators, freely available maps, freely available resources per county for restoration. And then we have lists of conservation groups because often these groups can be called upon for their um, information or knowledge or even collaboration, okay? So we have this for each county. Um, we also want to turn this, sorry, I keep checking my phone to make sure I'm on time here. Uh, we also wanna sort of turn Eco Restore into this um, sort of a, a community, if you will. 
So to do that, we um, have a blog post on relevant themes related to restoration. That's like semi-regularly updated. I'd say once every month or two, there's a new blog post. Um, there's a calendar with uh, restoration, conservation, native plant uh, relevant uh, events. And there's an opportunities page of jobs and grants related to ecological restoration in and around um, Arizona, okay? Now, there's another way that in not just visiting this page, but there's another way that you can get involved with EcoRestore. There's actually two ways. The first is that you can sign up right here for a, um, huh, that's, oh, sorry. First, sorry, you can join the mailing list. So once a month, I send out a um, newsletter just once a month, I won't spam you, I promise, with uh, restoration relevant items. So like cool news, usually it's pretty cool. Um, and events and tools for restoration practitioners and native plant enthusiasts of Arizona. And that's once a month, so you can sign up here. The other thing that we've just added is you can actually um, log in and have a sign up. So if you um, sign up for a login, what you can actually do is leave comments on species. And the reason that we thought that this was really important, if you remember this plant list that we generated from the, um, the plant quiz I took. So we have this plant list of uh, candidate species. One of the things you might ask is like, hmm, okay, well, this this um, Adonis blazing star, that looks kind of cool. I wonder if it works. Well, someone else down the road might have tried this species in their own backyard or their restoration project, and it didn't actually work very well. Maybe it didn't germinate well, or it got mowed down by rabbits or something. If you're logged in and have an account on EcoRestore, which is free, you can actually leave a comment and say, this species didn't work for me, or this species did work for me, or this species is impossible to find, or this species is really expensive. Just anything that might be useful for other people. So we're trying to facilitate some knowledge sharing here. So if you're interested in that, you can log in right here. Um, we are doing a lot of development with the Ursor. This was just deployed last year, um, I think last September. So it's been around active for a year and it's still growing. Right now, actually, I'm working with four other states and they're developing their own eco-restore portals for the other states. So what we're hoping is to have this like um, Southwest hub of eco-restore, which is like my dream. And actually the dream is to have it all across the United States and maybe the world, but um, we are working on that. And the other thing we're working on is um, trying to connect uh, businesses that are selling these species and having information in real time. So this is very difficult and we're trying to figure out how to do it. But for example, the, the plan is that when Adonis Blazing Star pops up, you would also get a list of the um, native nurseries that are selling Adonis uh, Blazing Star and how much it would be, for example. That will be in a while. But um, yeah, that's mostly what I have to say about Eco Restore. It's for everyone. If there's anything on here that you think is missing, if you go and you sell native plants and you're not on your county list, please email me and let me know. Um, please email me and let me know if there's an event that you think is really important and should be added, or if there's a job or a grant, or if there's something major that should be added. I am doing a lot of this sort of on my own as like the local expert, but I do not have all the information at all. And I want to make this as robust as possible. So um, shoot me an email and sign up for the um, newsletter and use Ecosport Store whenever you can. And I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Elise, and thank you to all of our presenters. It's really a pleasure to be able to host the three of you and introduce everybody to the tools that you're working on or that you're, you've developed and are still working on uh, to expand and, and take over the world. Um, and yeah, we definitely have some time for questions. There's been some good uh, chatter in the chat so far um, about the, the different tools that we have and, um, so there are a few questions from the chat that I'll, that I'll read off to get us started, um, but I'd really encourage everybody who's still here, thank you for still being here, um, to turn on your video, to unmute, and to, to ask the questions yourselves if, if you feel comfortable. Um, so the, the questions that we've got, um, we had one question from Edwin Juarez. Um, Edwin, if you're here and you feel comfortable, uh, would you like to, to ask your question to, to Austin? Yes. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, I was just, I might have missed it, but uh, uh, the, I was wondering what was the geography of that tool that Austin is putting together. 
uh, working on if it's just focused on southeastern Arizona or uh, the whole state. Yeah, at this point in time, we are just focusing on southeastern Arizona, primarily the uh, MRA major land resource areas 41 and then parts of 40. Um, we that was by design because it is quite a short term and small project. We didn't want to start big and run into a lot of issues and then run out of time to be able to fix them. So we're starting small at this point in time with the eye in the future of hopefully expanding. Thank you, Edwin and, and Austin. Um, Steve, Steve Sesney, you had a question for Austin as well. Um, would you, would you want to ask that, ask your question? Yeah, um, hopefully my camera's on. <clears throat> Austin, I was wondering, I, there's a lot of really cool stuff wrapped into that tool, especially the state and transition models I thought was really excellent. And also the ecological sites data, which I sometimes have, oh, I, I should say I'm with the Fish and Wildlife Service and I, I do some work in Southern Arizona. So very interested in this tool. Um, they do some brush removal and prescribed burning on the refuges where our, I, I do some work. And I just wondered if there was a way to understand sort of uh, how different sites may be impacted by invasive species for developing these kind of treatments. And if, is there a component of that in the tool? It's, it's a constant worry. Of, of ours when we're doing treatments uh, on refuge lands, you know, what, what may happen post-treatment, what's the level of invasibility on a site? Just, just wondering if there is some component of that wrapped into the tool. At this point in time, no, but it is a serious consideration, especially uh, with brush management in this yeah part of with, you know, you, you clear it all and no big worry, is it all just going to turn into layman's love grass? You know? <laughs> That's the one yep, or one yep. of them. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. far, I haven't been able to find a great uh, suitability map for layman's love grass. I know that like the Nature mm -hmm. Conservancy has developed a like an Arizona grasslands, like good condition versus invaded grassland kind of map, but um, the USGS and NASA were working on a um, invasive species forecasting system. And last time I checked layman's, it was mainly like tamarisk and woody yeah. invasive focused. Um, and last time I checked it, uh, like some of the grass species, especially layman's wasn't on there, but if anyone has any clues about that, and especially if it's government data, or government information, that means that we can bring it into the fold and use it. And that's where like, we are starting with the prototype, but the idea is that we can easily take things the way it's not useful for people, but also if there's something new that comes up and we have the permissions to be able to use it, to plug it right in easily as well. But yeah, no, that's it's definitely important. I have a ton of layman love grass and soils data and work with climate models. And you've just given me another project to do, but <laughs> I, 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 I've been focused on quail, not so much on layman love grass, but um, I think that would be a good effort for those to do some regional for, there's such a deep um, list of literature to draw from to get a, develop a good model and, lots of available data for doing that. Um, that's a good idea. I hope maybe I'll, maybe I'll have time to do that. I'm a spatial modeler, but um, I'm, maybe I might try some prototype models just for layman love grass in the sites I have data for. So that's for sure. That's, that would be cool. And feel free to always email me and reach out and if yeah. there's something I can help with or collaborate on, I'm more than willing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and Steve, you brought up um, the concern for for wildlife habitat when we're thinking not only about the, mm -hmm. the vegetation structure but the species that are there. Um, and I was right. wondering, Amanda, if the the triage tool is some is able to incorporate that, or is is thinking about the you know the different value of what grasses might be present or forbs might be present, not just the the vegetation structure. I I missed the very first part of what you're saying because I was reading a question in the chat, but um, I think you, was it, spe yeah, it's not going to be species specific, uh, if that's what the question was. We wish, yeah. but 
don't have that capability. Yeah, it's a big lift for sure. But I was just wondering how how folks that um that are contributing to the triage project are thinking about that consideration of like you know if you if you can reduce the 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 canopy cover of woody species can be a really good thing, but potentially the the habitat uh, value might not be as 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 high if it's just lemon left grass dominated or something. Yeah, like that. that's that's definitely a concern of ours. So um, that's. Really good question. And I guess that question could also extend to Elise and, and Eco Restore. Are you all thinking about the, yeah, is, is Eco Restore a tool that can be used to be thinking about how to combat invasive species or if you're doing a restoration project uh, that is at risk of, of layman encroachment, how does Eco Restore help users um, can take that into consideration? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think that um, ecological restoration and weed management go hand in hand because one underpins the other. And it's actually like my career goal for my life to have folks think that when they think of invasive plant management, ecological restoration is one of the tools they think about along with grazing and fire and herbicide. Um, we do have some sections on sort of how to deal with invasive plants. And in that tool, in the, in the survey, you can say if you have um, invasive plants on site, and what that will do will um, filter the species that come out as competitive. So that means that any species that we found evidence in the literature as being competitive against invasives, not just against other natives, they'll come up in that list. Um, there's certainly more that we can add, um, but I think that's a, a pretty good first step of thinking about, you know, um, you might want pollinator habitat, but often forbs are not Traditionally, the types of plants that are um, particularly robust against laymans, for example, and so maybe you know you can consider putting in some perennial bunch grasses that do a little better, sort of amongst your forbs, to at least keep the invasives at bay. Thanks, Elise. That's great. I feel like there's a lot, um, there's a lot more discussion that could happen around when we're thinking about uh, the different species that are coming back after various treatments. Um, but for now, I think we I can smell another workshop. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> There's definitely been some chatter around that. Um, but I wanted to get to some of the other questions that folks asked in the chat. Um, and I know that Valerie uh, had some questions for Amanda, but I think that those were, were answered mostly in the chat. But I wanted to give uh, Valerie to give you a chance to ask some of those questions if, if you still had, had any of them. I'm not sure if you're still with us, Valerie. Hi, no, I'm here. Sorry, oh, I, I took me a minute to, to get off the of mute. Yeah, I'm just catching up. So it sounds like um, you've, yeah, I was just kind of catching up on the thread. So you've, you've got, uh, you query the IMBCR data. Um, and so was that, did that include the Forest Service? I'm just curious, because usually those requests would come through me on the forest. I, I don't recall ever seeing any. Um, so I was just curious kind of about that data call. I don't believe so. Anne Bartasevich was the one who uh, was in charge of all of that. Um, so um, I don't I don't think so though because I've I've seen all the data. And um, but yeah, we would be interested in in more data. Of course, the more the better um, to make our models more robust. So uh, yeah, and I'll just there. I'll just add in though that the focus also was in grasslands, not on. I'm not sure the Forest Service may have grassland bird data from that from that area, but not on like Sky Island bird uh, population so much. Okay, yeah, and so I was that was going to be my next question is um, we don't have massive amounts of grasslands where we are, but we do have a lot of grasslands that are kind of in that transition zone between the pinyon juniper habitat. Um, and we've got kind of a, you know, a transition uh, gradient there, you know, four to five different kind of PJ transition zones and some of that in integrates with grasslands. So that was kind of my next question is if that data is of interest or um, purely just grassland data. Um, I guess we'd be definitely interested in learning more about it, um, what type of data it is and um, what years it covers and that kind of stuff. And, um, maybe looking at a map of where the survey points are located would help. Okay. Um, yeah, maybe we could get together. I, I'd be happy to chat offline more about that. Yeah, we've got data that goes back to like 2007. 
Great. Okay. Thanks. I'd be I'd be happy to send an email putting you all in touch with each other and maybe including Anne Bart Savage with that also. Sounds, Sounds good. Great. Thank you. And um, Valerie, just a follow up question for you. I'm I'm wondering if there are are tools that you use um, for when you're managing the land that you manage with the U.S. Forest Service, thinking about maintaining grasslands, uh, thinking about woody plant management, and those sort of things. Are there are there tools that you that you reach for that you that we didn't mention today? Um. So yeah, I. You know, one of the reasons that I've kind of was really interested in these presentations is I am kind of looking more at these types of tools, more decision support tools. Um, we have a lot of planning tools and models we use kind of looking out into the future and kind of um, particularly how to um, how our land management plans are developed. Um, but then when it comes down to the nitty gritty of project level implementation, that's where we're kind of looking for more types of decision support tools. And we are kind of like, um, kind of wading into those waters right now. Um, I'm working on um, some different geo database, geo databases um, right now internally to kind of think through um, the different project level implementation activities that we have going on. And then how we kind of marry that up with some of the other resource needs, like for wildlife. Um, so I'm really excited to see these different applications, and and I think that I could I could definitely see how we might be able to integrate that into some of our planning and, and implementation. Thanks, Valerie. That's great. Um, I know there was one other question. We're we're sort of closing in on the on two o'clock, so I wanted to get to the last question that was in the chat, and then. If anybody has any any last last ideas, um, but that was from Kelly. Kelly Wolf had a had a question or a comment for Elise um, and Kelly. I was wondering if you wanted to to unmute and, and ask about that connection if you're still with us. Yeah, I was just wondering if um, if we were also working with the Southwest Seed Partnership, but it sounds like that's already going on as well. Yeah, we're working with um, Kelly and I have been. Uh, sending some messages in the chat, but when I mentioned that um, we're attempting to expand Eco Restore, so I'm working with folks in different states and we are working with Southwest Seed Partnership and Melanie Giesler, and I mean, it's actually surprisingly inexpensive to deploy the website. You need some money for people to kind of collect the, collect the information, but um, so right now we're in the stage of uh, looking for some grants, some mid-sized, smaller grants to fund this stuff, but um, yes, very exciting. So I'm working with folks in New Mexico, Utah, uh, Nevada, and Colorado. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Elise. Um, yeah, I wanted to just sort of open it up more broadly right now. If anybody else has any questions for, for the three panelists today, or just questions for the group, there's a, a lot of expertise on this virtual room, uh, in this virtual room right now. And I wanted to offer that uh, you know, a couple minutes to to just field any questions that that are here that are simmering after these these presentations. I have a super minor question um, for Eco Restore. Um, you mentioned gathering information from the end users. Um, have you gotten a pretty good response, you know, for certain plant species or applications that you start to, you're, you're able to start collecting data on sort of success or failure or how, how are people responding pretty well? Yeah. So um, a week ago, we deployed this sort of login and I was immediately inundated with tons of spam requests and there was a ton <laughs> of spam on the website. So just two days ago, yeah. RIT people changed it around and like up the security features. So no, Great. we don't have any because all the, it's all spam. <laughs> so I don't know yet um, how it's going to look. Uh, I've gotten some like dubious requests uh, and my apologies if any of you have sent in requests in the last like six hours because just the requests seem dubious, but, um, and now like I'm once bitten twice shy because there was just like so much like movie spam put up on the site. Um, so I don't know, uh, but uh, I, I'm looking forward to seeing if it works. Um, the thing is like, I, we don't have any um, 
there's no reason for people to leave information unless they feel like they want to. Um, and sometimes when you have things like that, like people don't add information because they're like, I don't have time or whatever. So um, we're going to think about once we have this sort of security thing solved, um, we're going to try to figure out ways to encourage people to leave information, both um, good and bad in the sense of this worked or this didn't work, or this is too expensive or the species is impossible to find. Um, but we haven't gotten there yet. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Elise. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, I, I think that at this point, we're pretty close to the top of the hour uh, or bottom of the hour. I'm never sure which one is when you're getting close to two o'clock, but we're close to it. And um, yeah, I just wanted to, to once again, thank all of our speakers for being here. Uh, thank everybody who is asking questions. We really appreciate the engagement. There's a lot to follow up here. We had a whole list of questions that we developed, we have developed. Um, and I, we'll see if we can get some of those responses and send them out as emails. Um, we're also follow up if we can with uh, a grassland community of practice call where we can continue some of these discussions um, in the next couple of weeks. So please keep, uh, keep an eye to the email for that because it seems like there's a lot of interest in a follow up um, discussion about things like lemon and lovegrass and invasive species. Um, and and we'll, we'll be following up with that. Um, I also wanted to share a couple announcements from CCAST. So we have another uh, panel discussion similar to this one uh, on September 28th at 2 p.m. I'm going to put the registration link for that one into the chat right now. Um, so feel free to register for that. The, that panel discussion will be focused more on drought and, and different um, tools libraries. So Austin talked about the rangelands gateway tool and we'll be hearing from Ann Gondor who is with us for a while. I'm not sure if Ann is still here, but I'm really excited to hear more about that tool. Um, and specifically because it something that we've been hearing a lot in these discussions is that there are a lot of tools out there and there's a lot of information out there and people want to be able to keep track of that. So the example, at least on Eco Restore for those lists of tools by states, things like that, super helpful. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you, Amanda, for ask, answering the questions in the in the chat. Um, and we'll, we'll send out a follow-up email as well with some of those questions and answers and, and some of those pertinent points. Um, this chat, this uh, discussion is also being recorded. We'll post it up onto the CCAST YouTube channel um, that, so that you can share it with other people who may have missed it as well. Um, and I think that's all I have for the CCAST announcements. If anybody else, any of the speakers have any announcements, uh, for upcoming things on your end, please take this last minute to, to share those. Um, and if not, that'll, that'll be all. And thank you so much for joining us.